left off on page 365 of A Good Man is Hard to Find. We just finished discussing, if I remember correctly, um, top of the page, when Red Sam says, Red Sammy says, a good man is hard to find. Everything is getting terrible. I remember the day you could go off and leave your screen door unlatched, not so, not no more. And we talked about what that implied, you know, um, not only for air movement and stuff, but because there was no crime, et cetera. So, a good man is hard to find. Go back very briefly to Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 and following. And the story that is told there. Rich young guy comes to Jesus. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, before he tells him what to do, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. And then he says, follow the commandments. Which ones? Jesus gives them about six. Done them all. What else? And Jesus says, in Matthew, he simply says, go and sell all that you have, Give that to the poor. You will lay up treasure in heaven and come and follow me. In another version of the story, he says, or the gospel says, Jesus, perceiving the man's heart, knowing that he was rich, said, go and sell all, the, all that you have, distribute that to the poor, and come and follow me. He doesn't say the, the part about laying up treasure in heaven. Okay? Okay. And when I talked about that on Wednesday, I said, you know, I would um, tie into the end of the story. And we're going to talk about it quite a bit more when we get to the last page. A good man is hard to find, Red Sam says. And they go on and talk about how everything's getting terrible. Everything is getting terrible. In a page or two, Bailey is going to say twice, we're in a terrible predicament. Okay. What's the everything is getting terrible, and what's the terrible predicament? They're not the same thing, but they both describe a general feeling. Okay, In her letters, um, O'Connor says that she writes the way she does as a Catholic to explore the terrible world we're getting to. And in some places, she goes on and elaborates. And she's talking about the kind of the dominant cultural worldview. That is, the way you look at the world. Not this way, but intellectually, morally, spiritually. How you understand the world. How you make sense out of everything that happens. Okay? And in doing so, she's talking about two main, two big schools of philosophical thought. Or two big schools of philosophy. Nihilism, the first one, and existentialism. Existentialism is kind of a child of nihilism. Okay? N-I-H-I-L-I-S-M. Friedrich Nietzsche, German philosopher, is the founder of this branch of philosophy. 1844 to 1899 to 1900. Died in an insane asylum. Died totally insane. Nietzsche is the one who coined the phrase, God is dead. He doesn't just say, God is dead. He says, God is dead and we have killed him. No. He doesn't mean there was a God out there that we literally killed. He means the idea of God is no longer needed. We've done away with that. Why? Again, writing in the late 19th century, he says that because of you know, the so-called advance of human thought, age of enlightenment, age of philosophy, beginning 1700 or so, late 1600s, on up through that day. The industrial age, humanity is, you know, now can mass produce, now in the 19th century, mass produce food and goods and things like that. Lifting, capitalism is lifting people out of poverty, all that kind of stuff, okay? We don't need God anymore. So God is dead and we have killed him. He then says, and that makes everything permissible. Now think what that means for a moment. 
everything is allowed. Nothing is forbidden. Why? If God is dead, what else is dead? What is gone along with the idea of God? What comes after life? Nothing. In other words, no reward for being good and no punishment for being bad. Everything is permissible. Marx kind of adopted some of this. Hitler adopted a lot of it. Hitler, Nietzsche was Hitler's favorite philosopher. Kind of, kind of says a lot. So, no eternal punishment, no eternal reward. This is what there is. So what? How do you how do you live your how do you live your life based on that kind of philosophical outlook? Outlook. There's really only two ways. Hedonism, man. If it feels good, do it. If you can get more out of life, get more out of life. Okay, what's the other way? Just kill yourself. Because hedonism suggests you can get pleasure. Sure, there are pleasurable things in life. How long does it last? You get high, you get drunk, it lasts for a while, and then you wake up and you don't feel so good. So you get higher, you get more drunk. It's short, and it's always followed by a down. So you can ride those peaks, but then you gotta go downhill, okay? It's not long lasting. If you take the philosophical outlook of nihilism, however, to its logical uh, extension, because when he said God is dead, Nietzsche was also saying, and this is what these two writers I'm going to talk about in just a moment picked up on. He also said, this life is totally devoid of meaning. The world is totally devoid of meaning. The universe is totally devoid of meaning. Why? It just is. And when I say just is, I'm not talking about the being devoid of meaning. I mean, the world, everything in it, the world meaning all of the universe, and everything in it just is is. If God is dead, there's no creation. It's just random chance. If it's just random chance, then there's no reason for you or me to exist. We're a speck on the butt of the universe, essentially. Okay? Try to intellectually live that kind of outlook. What makes you get up in the morning? If everything you do is totally pointless. I don't wear my ring because my finger's too big. If a wedding is totally pointless, if marriage is totally pointless, if there is no such thing as love, because there isn't, according to this, because love is, is not just a feeling, it is ascribing meaning. There is no meaning. You can't make any meaning, according to Nietzsche. We are no different than a paramecium or an amoeba. We're just a little smarter. <laughs> wow, that's pretty bleak. That, that's the ultimate mentality people have who commit suicide. Because what do they see? There is no light at the end of the tunnel. It's just a tunnel, man. A 17th century writer named forgetting his first name, last name Hobbes, wrote in his book, Leviathan, the life of humanity is poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Our lives, poor, nasty, brutish, and then you die. In other words, you've probably seen the bumper sticker before, life's a beach. There's a corollary to that, change the vowel. Life's a bitch, and then you die. So why go on, all right? That's Nietzsche, 19th century. Jean Paul Sartre and Paul Camus, French writers, 30s and 40s, 
late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, who are the pretty much called the fathers of the school of philosophy called existentialism. Existentialism reigned from the late 30s up through the 70s, okay? Existentialism was a modified form of this. Now, most good, solid existentialists would say, that's not true. But I would argue with them, yes, it is true. Existentialism takes this and says, you're right, life is meaningless. There is nothing outside that gives meaning. There's nothing outside our existence that gives morality. Morality is simply what we decide is morality. What is right, what is wrong, what is good, what, that kind of thing, okay? But they both said we can make our life meaningful. You do that by authentication or validation. You authenticate your existence. Notice the root of that. A-U-T-H, like author. You write your own meaning. Every one of the things we will read in here is trying to convey what? Some kind of meaning. No author writes to not express an idea. None of them. The idea might be nonsense. I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. It's a nonsense thing. Or we're going to read the poem Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Totally doesn't make any sense at all. What's it conveying? Nonsense. Nonsense is a meaning. Okay? It conveys this lacks sense or logic. They said you can give, create meaning for yourself. How do you do that? You do it so that when you take your last breath, the world, whether writ large or small, knows you've existed. Everybody wants to know that they've left a mark. How can you leave a mark? Just think of the phrase for a moment. You can bestow a great gift to somebody, a billion dollars to a university, you know, for an endowment, whatever, name a building after you, Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial, Washington Memorial, all these memorials. Why? We know they existed. They did great things, okay? How else can you leave a mark? You can shoot somebody in the head. That leaves a mark. You can do something most people consider moral. You can help a little old lady across the street in busy traffic, or you can push her out in front of the oncoming truck. She and others will know you existed. Okay? Why do some, I've never made this connection before, why do some news organizations refuse to print mass murderers' names? It's the remembrance that gives that person validity, that gives them authenticity, okay? So, notice this authentication, this validation, it is amoral. That is, there's no morality tied to it. It can be a great altruistic, benevolent act. Mother Teresa, a nun, Catholic nun, who at a young age, in her early 20s, goes to live in Calcutta and serve the outcasts on the street. Children who are left to die, babies, newborns, thrown in an alley. She would walk around the streets at night and pick up those children and take them back to her orphanage and raise them as nobody else would. You can do that or you can become Hitler. It doesn't matter. Both those people authenticated their existence, okay? Sartre, they, they both wrote philosophical works, essays and such. They both wrote, wrote works of fiction. Sartre's most famous work of fiction, No Exit. It's a play. There's only a couple characters, and the characters are in a room, and the room doesn't have a door. There's no exit. What's the room? 
no exit means this is all there is. There's nothing else around it. Period. You come into this place, you go out of this place. That's it. You don't come in from somewhere else. It's just you rise up and come to me, dissolve and go away. Okay? So, uh, Tammuz is an essay on the old Greek myth of Sisyphus. And he extrapolates from that myth to describe and says, essentially, this is our life. Anybody know what the myth is? Anybody know the myth? A guy, because he offended the gods, has to, for all eternity, to use your language, push a big ass rock up a hill. He gets right to the top. He's just getting ready to get it over onto the top where it'll come to rest and it rolls back down. Back down and then he eats it and he does that for all eternity. Futility is the point. Our lives, Tamu says, are utterly futile. There's no point. Okay? Pretty bleak stuff, right? That's the predicament. Not the specific one Bailey's talking about, but the general predicament of thinking people. People who consider what does it mean to be alive in the 1940s and 1950s when O'Connor is writing, okay? So they go on and they place all the problems in the world, meaning their little worlds, where? The damn foreigners. Europe. Why Europe? World War II. Talked about this a little bit the other day, okay? So, family leaves. And the grandmother falls asleep, takes cat naps, we're told. And after one of them, she wakes up, and they're outside the town of Tombsboro. A little bit of foreshadowing. The fortress of tombs, or the defended place of tomb. That's what borough means. Dwelling, if you want, of tombs. Okay? And when she does, she remembers an old plantation she had visited when she was a young lady. Notice we're told she visited it in this location. And she starts to tell the story to the children about this old plantation. And when Sherman was making his march through Georgia, the people in the plantation, they hid their silver in a secret compartment, in a secret panel. And the kids immediately think what? Treasure hunt. Let's go find it. So they start berating, yelling at their father, John Wesley's kicking the back of the seat, giving his father kidney punches. June Starr is hanging over the front seat, screaming in her mother's ear. No seat belts, by the way. Okay. And Bailey's, the grandmother's, we ought to do it. It'd be good for the children. You know, you want anything done politically, all you need are three words for the children, and it'll get done. And he finally says, yes. She says that the road to it is about a mile back. It's a dirt road. He's like, oh, dirt road. Dirt roads in the early 1950s, late 40s, were very common in Georgia. Okay? So they go back. They start making their way down the dirt road. And page 366, middle of the page, Bailey says, this place had better turn up in a minute. In other words, he's almost to the point of turning around. The grandmother says, it's not much farther. And the narrator tells us, and notice the, how the narrator does the time. Okay? Narrator tells us, as soon as, she, as soon as she says, it's not much farther, a thought comes to her mind. It so surprises her that she jumps. She kicks her legs. She moves the valise. The valise gets off of the basket the cat is in. The cat jumps out and launches onto Bailey's shoulder and neck. All four paws, claws out. Then we get the result of that. We're not told what that causes immediately. We get the effects of the cause. The children were thrown to the floor and the mother, clutching the baby, was thrown out the door onto the ground. The old lady was thrown into the front seat. The car turned over once and landed right side up. Notice we're not told 
At that point, they had an accident. It takes one of the children in the next paragraph to say, we had an accident. We did the effects first, okay? And that's where we're told the cat is hanging on to Bailey for dear life. Then we're told what the thought was that the grandmother had. Oops, plantation wasn't here. It was in Tennessee. They're not even near Tennessee anymore. They're four hours into Georgia, at least. Bailey, we're told, removes the cat from his neck and does what? Wham! Throws it against a tree. Cat's not going to be scratching anybody again. He gets out of the car, starts looking for the children's mother. If you click on that link on the syllabus and listen to this, this is really where you notice the humor in this story. Because it, it takes Flannery O'Connor's voice and her reading of it. Because this is deadpan, drawl humor. He looks for the children's mother. He finds her. She's sitting against the side of the red gutted ditch, holding the screaming baby. But she only had a cut down her face and a broken shoulder. Only? Notice this, the cut. She had a cut on her face. It's not what it says. She had a cut down her face. On can be just a scratch. Down implies it's a big cut and a broken shoulder. Okay. Later on, she's going to start wheezing. She's wheezing for two reasons. One is shock from the pain of her shoulder. When I tore my rotator cuff, I think I mentioned it here, you know, I was getting close to going in and out of conscious, conscious. I was near the pain because the pain was so bad. And I was going, <laughs> my wife would go, breathe, breathe. Okay. Children are screaming. June Star looks at the grandmother, but nobody's killed. Why? That's humorous. What does she mean? She means, but nobody's killed. The same way Red Sammy's wife says, ain't she cute, the second time. First time she says, ain't she cute, about June Star, she's tap dancing on the dance floor. The second time is after she asks June Star, would you like to come live with me and be my little girl? She goes, no, this place, you know, is hillbilly heaven kind of a thing. Ain't she cute? And she shuts it. Children's mother, first time she speaks, maybe a car will come. But one will. Grandmother, I believe I've injured an organ. Why? She wants people to have sympathy. She's the only one, except for maybe the two children, not hurt. Bailey's hurt, right? Cat claws. And we're told the road was about 10 feet above. And they could see only the tops of the trees. So they're down here, cars down there. They're down here, they're in a gulch. We're told the dirt is red, why? Go to the middle of Georgia and start digging, it's red clay. Off to one side, the, the way the gulch goes, pine trees, dark. You look at this side, the gulch, you've got red, and above, when you look up, all you see are the tops of the pine trees on the other side of the road. You can't see the road. Okay? This is going to become important. Because we're going to be told essentially trees on this side, trees on this side. Trees are what color? Green, green. Or maybe dark, dark. They're going to look up above and only see what? Twice we're going to be told. No sun, no clouds, just blue sky, okay? Car shows up, page 367, the end of paragraph 70. 
last two lines. It was a big, black, battered hearse, like an automobile. What's a hearse? Who drives hearses? Ghostbusters, which is appropriate, by the way. Funeral homes. A hearse is what the body gets delivered to the cemetery at. A hearse is what the body gets taken from where the person died to the funeral home. Right? This is a hearse like automobile. What does that really mean? It is a hearse. Why? Because there are no other cars like hearses. An old station wagon from there, there's actually station wagons available now, from what I remember. 70s, early 80s, you know, car with seats in the front, a middle row of seats, maybe a second row, and then a big area in the back, sometimes with a third row that faces out the back seat. It's not like a hearse. A hearse has a higher space inside because some caskets are this deep, the coffin, or this deep. And they gotta go be, you know, tied down and all that kind of stuff. Not like a van. They're long, they're heavy. I've driven one a couple of times, okay? It's a hearse, foreshadowing. Hearses carry dead bodies. Hearses bring, in one sense, death. Notice, it'd be very different if it said it was an uh, ambulance-like automobile, because that would imply aid is coming. Comes to a stop. Right here, they can see it. Three men get out. One of the men, two young men, one of them stands on one side of the family. The other one stands on the other side of the family. Okay? And then the older of the men gets out. Driver. He looks down. Hair's going gray, silver-rimmed glasses. No shirt, looks scholarly, has on blue jeans. He's holding a black hat and a gun. And then we're told, oh yeah, the boys also have guns. Children scream, the grandmother says, we flipped twice, he says, no, just once. We saw it. John Wesley, what you got that gun for? What you gonna do with that gun? And the older man says to the children's mother, would you mind calling them children to sit down by each other, make me nervous. I, I would just, I would like you to sit down together. Okay. She calls for them to come in. Bailey, look here now. We're in a predicament. What's the predicament specific that Bailey's talking about? Does Bailey know who this is? What did the grandmother begin the story with? Bailey, now you look here. You look here really what this says. I'm just listening. Did Bailey look at the newspaper? At that moment in time, he doesn't. I think it's very safe to assume once she stops, stops harping on him, he probably picks it up and looks at it. I mean, when you say, just look here and read what it says that this guy did to these people, your attention. Okay. Grandmother says, scrambling to her feet, you're the misfit. I think when Bailey says we're in a predicament, he knows the predicament. And when she says you're the misfit, it's no longer a predicament. See, a predicament can be gotten out of. Might be hard, but there's an escape possible. In other words, it's not the case of no exit. Who had never made that connection before? What has the grandmother just done? No exit. What does the misfit say? He asked him, but would have been better off y'all, lady, if you hadn't have recognized. Why? Now I gotta kill you. Can't 
have witnesses here. Bailey turns and says something to his mother. And notice what we're told. She burst out in tears, and the misfit blushes. Why? The summer. The mis um, what does Bailey say to his mother? That makes the misfit blush. Notice the misfit lady, go, the misfit goes on and says, top of 368, don't you get upset? Sometimes a man says things he don't mean. Do you think Bailey meant what he said? Where, where did that outburst come from? I, I think, okay? I'll admit, I'm probably reading this into the story. Or maybe it's because I've read the story so many times, I feel like I know Bailey. This is coming from years and years and years of, baby, baby, you do this, baby, you read this, baby, rah, 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 rah. he blows up. Mama, shut your, and just, it just spews out. Does it mean he hates her? No, it's the anger and built up frustration. The grandmother. You wouldn't shoot a lady, would you? Who's she talking about? How is she dressed? She's dressed in her Sunday best so that everyone would know if they found her on the side of a road, she's a lady. Notice what she doesn't say. You wouldn't kill a family, would you? You wouldn't kill that little baby. You wouldn't kill this cute little girl, this nice boy. You wouldn't kill my daughter. You wouldn't kill a lady. F them. Let me live. I mean, that's the import of what she's saying. <coughs> he says, I'd hate to have to. I know you're a good. I know you're a good man. Title, you're a good man is hard to find. I know you're a good man. You don't look a bit like you have common blood. What does she mean by common? She means low, base, like the lowest common denominator. So if she doesn't think he has common blood, what kind of blood does she think he has? High class. Not necessarily high up class, you know, Rothschilds, Windsors. High class meaning good upstanding people pillars of the community kind of you know i know you must come from nice people you've got good ancestry in other words he says yes and finest people in the world god never made a better woman than my mother bobby please watch them children you know they make me nervous then he's the one who says, don't see no sun nor no cloud either. What the hell does that have to do with it? And Grandma, yeah, it's a beautiful day. It's like channeling her Fred Rogers. Listen, you shouldn't call yourself the misfit because I know you're a good man at heart. What did the newspaper say about him? Just look you, see here what it says he did to these people. Does that refer to just killing them? I don't think so. I think this was particular, these were particularly heinous killings. He did horrible things to these people. I'm not saying he's a Jeffrey Dahmer, or, you know, anything like that. <clears throat> if you don't know Jeffrey Dahmer, look it up. D-A-H-M-E-R. I don't encourage you. I can just look at you and tell that you're good. Red Sam, a good man is hard to find. All right? Bailey, hush, get ready to shut up, let me handle this. And we're told he's squatting in the position of a runner about to sprint forward. He used to run track in high school. You get down there, you get in your blocks, one foot forward, one foot back, you got your fingers down, and you're. Why is he in that position? 
Is he in that position because he's going to take off to take on the misfit? I don't think so. What is it possible Bailey's thinking? Can I save myself? Sorry, honey. <laughs> What's his mother thinking? Can I save myself? Grandmother reaches up to adjust her hat as if she were going to the woods with him, but it came off in her hand. Sorry, I skipped a passage. Hiram comes back, says it's going to take half an hour to fix his car. Misfit says, okay. First you and Bobby Lee get him and that little boy step off yonder with you. He points to Bailey and John Wesley. The boys want to ask you something. Would you mind stepping back in them woods for a moment? Now, how were the woods described earlier? Like a gaping open of mouth. The woods get anthropomorphized or personified with human features. Gaping open mouth means what? When do you have, when does a human have, or a creature for that part, have a gaping open mouth? We're going to have maybe two scenarios. First one, feeding, eating. Other one, maybe in death, because the mouth will open. Neither image is good. Neither image portends well for this family. Okay? And that's when Bailey says we're in a terrible predicament. Grandmother reaches up to fix her brim, and the brim falls off. Hiram goes up to Bailey and very gently puts his hand under his arm, helps him up like Bailey's an old man. Bailey is not an old man. Late 1940s, early 1950s, the odds are greatly that Bailey is probably in his late 20s, maybe 30s. Because parents back then had children at much younger ages than generally we do today. They walk off towards the woods, and as they reach the dark edge, Bailey, we're told, leans against a tree. The language is, he turns and supports himself against a gray naked pine tree. Why does he support himself? What does using the verb supporting imply? He needs that crutch. His knees are about to buckle on him. Because what, what do you know is going to happen? He's got seconds to live. He's afraid to die. And he yells, Honey, I'll be back. Honey, it'll be okay. Honey, take care of the baby. Nope. He yells. Mama, wait on me. Why does he yell to his mother and not his wife? Is that just human instinct? Some people would say yes. I don't think so. I got married, parents were pushed aside. Maybe it was me. Wife came number one. I've told my kids, I've got four of them, they're all in their 20s and 30s now. At various points, if I ever had to make a choice, sorry guys, mom comes first. She's the first one I'll save. You, you came from her, love you dearly. She's first, I chose her against everything else, okay? Bailey doesn't do that. I think this is the nail in the coffin that proves Bailey's a mama's boy. He hasn't cut those apron strings. And she says, come back this instant, as they disappear into the woods. Bailey and then she turns to the mister. I just know you're a good man. You're not a bit common. No, nope, I ain't a good man. He says, but I'm not the worst in the world either. There's a lot worse people than I am. Okay? He says, my daddy says I was a different kind of breed of dog. I always had to know what it is. Meaning what? He 
says. He's going to be into everything. Let me go back up. Daddy said it's some that can live their whole life out without asking about it, and it's others has to know why it, what's the it? They can live their whole life out without asking about it. The it? Life. Why am I here? What's my purpose? What's the meaning of it all? In the 1960s, there was a movie starring Michael Caine. What's it all about? The movie was Alfie. Theme song, Oscar winner, if I remember correctly. What's it all about, Alfie? The it? Life. It was this, or is it this? The movie's all about this. Okay? He says, Daddy says I was one of those, I had to put his wings out. I had to delve, I had to look, I had to ask questions. Okay? And they apologized for not wearing a shirt. They keep talking. The children's mother screams. Where are they taking him? Him. Who's him? Who is taken off to the woods? Bailey and John Wesley. Him is a singular pronoun. Shouldn't she say, where are they taking them? I think this tells us something about the mother. Where is her strongest tie? It's to her husband. And then the grandmother says, you can be honest. Just take her words, but settle down. Not have people chasing me. He says, yes, and somebody's always after you. And then she asks, do you have a prayer? She's got a spring Jesus on her. Let's have a come to Jesus moment. He says, no. <laughs> Why the pistol report right then? It's like an exclamation point. Nope, I don't pray. She jerks her head around. She calls Bailey's name out again. He says, what he used to do. Okay, he never prayed, but he was a gospel singer. He's done all kinds of work. Pray, 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 pray. Is she telling the misfit to pray? What's she doing? She's trying to pray. But all she can do is get out the word meaning to pray. She doesn't say, Jesus. And he says, I never was a bad boy. Somewhere along the line, I did something wrong. I got sent to the pen. I was buried alive. And he just looks her straight in the eyes. He doesn't mean literally buried alive. She said, well, that's when you should have started to pray. What did you do that got you? He goes, turn to the right, it's a wall. What's he talking about? She said you should have started praying then. He's back with, I was buried alive. Turn to the right, there's a wall. Turn to the left, there's a wall. Turn to the back, there's a wall. Turn to the front, there's a wall. Turn to the up, there's a ceiling. It's a wall. Turn to the down, there's a floor. It's a wall. Meaning, I was in a box. Guess what? He's not talking about the pen. Life, we're each in a box that we cannot break out of. No. There's no real connection possible between people, according to existentialism. We are all totally isolated. If you study the history of advertising, You'll come across an ad in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s by AT&T, Ma Bell, back before the telecommunications industry was broken up. Okay? There was one company, Ma Bell. They came out with an ad, telephone, reach out and, anybody know the rest? 
touch someone. That implies reaching out like this, and I, if I remember correctly, I think they might have even used in one of the ads the image from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, where God is reaching out with his hand, his finger pointed, and Adam's hand is just kind of there limp, because Adam hasn't been made alive yet. And God's touching Adam, giving him the spark of divinity, giving him life. Reach out and touch somebody implies we're isolated. We now use a verb that was originally a noun. We use a noun as a verb to, and you've got them on your phones, your contacts. What does it literally mean? It means to bridge a gap. It's talking about an electrical relay. Now we talk about it to reach out and touch someone. He talks about the walls. And he says, I sat there, I sat there trying to remember what it was I've done the night before. I don't know what I've done. Well, maybe they put you, no, no mistake, they had papers on me. Okay? I keep talking. She says, you must have killed somebody. You must have done something. He said, no. Head shrink, head doctor, said he killed his father. She said, but that's not true. My dad died in 1918. Why did the head shrink say, you must have killed your father? very next thing we're going to read. The play by Sophocles, Oedipus the King, gave rise by Sigmund Freud to a dominant school of psychoanalysis that said the cause, the central cause for pretty much all human problems are two, twofold. The Oedipus complex and the electric complex. The Oedipus complex is essentially every man wants to kill his father and sleep with his mother. And every woman wants to kill her mother and sleep with her father. That all human problems can be boiled down to those two things. I agree with the character in the Oedipus play. He said, what a load of shit. She says, it's a stupid dream. That's all it was. Anyways, they keep talking. Two more pistol, uh, one more pistol report, by the way, that we, I didn't talk about. And she says, top of 370. If you would pray, Jesus would help you. It's all you need, man. Just look to Jesus. He goes, that's right. And if I were directing this, making a short play of this, I would have her get this look on her face like, yes. I've got my open. I've got my foot in the door. He says, that's right. Well, then why don't you pray? I don't want no help. I don't need help. Look at me. I'm doing fine. Doing all right by myself. Bobby Lee and Hiram come back out. One of them, Bobby Lee is driving a yellow shirt with tariffs on it. Where did we see that yellow shirt before? The narrator stopped for a moment and said, told us about what Bailey was wearing. A yellow short sleeve shirt with tariffs on it. Why? We're going to Florida. He's going to wear a tropical shirt. Show me that shirt, Bobby Lee. He puts it on. And he says, no, lady, I found out the crime don't matter. You can do one thing or you can do another. Kill a man or kick a tire off his car. Sooner or later, you're going to forget what it was you've done and just be punished for it. Kill a man or kick a tire off his car. That's validation. He doesn't mean steal the tire. He means help him repair a flat. You can be a a, you know, uh, angel in the midst, so to speak, help somebody, or you could kill him and take his car. Doesn't matter, you're still punished. How so? That's when the mother starts making Jesus noises. And the mystic says to her, would you let that little girl like to step off yonder with Bobby Lee and hire him, join your husband? Notice, it's a question, not a command. He doesn't tell her to leave. He gives her the option, rhetorically at least. And she says, yes, thank you. 
What does the misfit show that June Starr and John Wesley don't? He might be a mass murderer, but he has manners. Courtesy is important. And she says, yes, thank you. So they go help her up. Her left arm's just hanging. She's holding the baby with the right arm. And they start to walk off towards the woods with Bobby Lee holding little June Star's hand. And now, alone, the grandmother finds she can't talk. She'd lost her voice. The narrator now says, not a cloud in the sky nor the sun. Just nothing around her but woods. She wants to tell him he must pray, but all she says is, Jesus, Jesus. He hasn't, Jesus thrown everything off balance. That implies, until Jesus, everything was balanced. Meaning, you live, you die, all's cool. How did Jesus throw everything off balance? It was the same case with him as with me. Meaning, we were both tried. We were both convicted. Except, he hadn't committed any crime. Notice what we have here. This is essentially a sermon being told by a mass murderer. This is the, you know, I put up here the other day, grotesque. She uses the, the grotesque to kind of break through people's preconceived notions. A mass murderer talking about Jesus? She says, Jesus didn't commit a crime. I obviously did because they had the papers. He says, but because I don't remember what I did, that's why I signed my name. So he dips his finger in the blood of the corpse and writes, misfit, makes them sure they know. It's his way of validating his existence. Okay? He says, I do that because I can't make what all I've done wrong fit what all I've gone through in punishment. He's not talking about punishment in the pen. He's talking about punishment in this life. He's going to address what he means. Does it seem right to you, lady, that one is punished a heap and another ain't punished at all? What's he talking about? Bringing up the idea of fairness. Is it fair that some people get born into fabulously wealthy families with wonderful lives while somebody else was born in a ghetto or to a poor family? Fair? See, in these philosophies, you can't talk about fairness. Nothing's fair. Because the idea of fairness implies some kind of standard. There is something inside that says there is an ought, an O-U-G-H-T, to everything. Like, I ought to do that. That means there is something that motivates or compels me to other than myself. God. Or the devil, you know, whichever, but however you want to think about it. There's none of that. Okay? So his point, does it seem right? That some people are punished horribly in the standards of their existence, the mere how they go about their lives and the opportunities they're given. Well, whereas others, all the doors are open. And she just says, Jesus, you got good blood. I know you wouldn't shoot a lady. I know you come from my, I pray to Jesus. I'll give you all the money I've got. Notice this very pithy reply. Never abide it. Gave an undertaker a tip. Once you're dead, you can't what? Give any kind of tips. What has he just told her? Lady, you're already dead. You're just taking your last gasp of breath. Because everything she has, in that car at least, is now going to be his. And 
and she cries out, Bailey boy, Bailey boy. Does she think Bailey is just now being shot? No, why is she calling out for Bailey? She's the only one left now of their family. He's the only thing that she really connected to. Now look at what the misfit does. He hears, baby boy, baby boy. And he says, Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead. What is he linking her calling out Bailey boy to? Lazarus, come forth. You can't raise the dead, Bailey. Why not? Because Jesus was God. Only Jesus could raise the dead. A good man is hard. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. There's the link. Okay? What's his point? And he shouldn't have done it. Why not? Because he, the misfit, wasn't there. He says, if I'd have been here, I'd have seen it. If I'd have seen it, I'd have known. If I'd have known, I wouldn't be the way I am now. Shouldn't have done it. Notice, he doesn't have faith. That's what the problem is. And what does the grandmother do when he finishes the little speech with a snarl? I know I'm going a little bit over. He stopped speaking, and we're told the grandmother's head cleared for an instant. Just a moment. She what? She sees, perceives, cleared it. And what does she see? Why? You're one of my babies. You're one of my children. Is the grandmother just a grandmother? She's not. She doesn't have multiple babies. She only has Bailey. Who slash what is the grandmother? She's the church. And what have we seen the grandmother do up to this point? It's been only concerned with itself. What is the church supposed to do? What does Jesus tell his disciples to do? Love one another as I have loved you. Meaning, die for the others. Serve the others. When she says that, what does she do? Because she doesn't only say it. She breaks through the walls. Touches them. And as soon as she touches them, boom, 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 he kills her. Why? That's proof. <laughs> That's proof of Jesus. She breaks through. He can't handle that. His perspective won't allow that. And he tells one of the boys, she'd have been a good woman if there had been somebody to kill her every minute of her life. Meaning, it took that moment for her to see, clearly. Remember, you know, we're talking about a parable? It, for those who have eyes to see, she finally sees. She no longer thinks about herself. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, there's a quiz due tonight. Somebody reminded me. I think it's 20 questions with 10 extra credit. You have 20 minutes. Most of the questions can be answered with only one or two words. And then I'll put up a quiz for O'Connor. That'll be due Sunday or Monday night. And then we'll have a quiz over all the fiction. Um, an exam over all the fiction that will be due, I believe it is a week from Sunday. You'll see it in the calendar, and I'll send out an email.